in the beginning was the word the word was with god and the word was god and when you hear the word from god it will make you experience your divine nature we are going to the gospel of mark chapter 9 line number 42 in the earlier line jesus had mentioned that whosoever take care of for his disciples and followers who may be moving about at that time in the country of israel judea and the neighborhood neighboring areas who whoever entertains them then those people would obtain the reward by divine providence having said that much now in line number 42 he talks of he talks of the hermits and whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea so he uses these words whosoever shall offend one of these little ones he is using the word little ones for they are his children the children of god you become a child of god when you get baptized with the holy spirit at that time you acquire a new nature a new disposition a new character a complete overhauling of your inner psychosis transpires and you are now reborn you are now born again as a new person your old ways have gone and you have a new spirit has entered into you and with this new spirit which is a which is a spirit of god you begin to operate and function henceforth in the world two remarkable things transpire when the baptism of with the holy spirit transpires one is that one this passion occurs in the person the person's passions and desires of mundane things all totally vanish and disappear that's one factor all his worldly ambitions evaporate and it's are no more and the second factor is a new spirit comes into him to engage his mind and heart and person towards god the divine so he is now born again a new person imbibed or imbued with a spirit and a longing to know god so
So therefore, and at the same time, when this state of affairs transpires in a person, he becomes innocent. There is innocence in the person and he functions and moves about like a child because of the sweet innocence which is observed and present in this person. Then thereafter, this person automatically takes the life of a hermit monk. It's a very natural process. Or if he has still certain other factors which are holding him, then wherever he is, he would still keep on functioning like a hermit with very little desires, very little wants, very peacefully and quietly. Because one of the symptoms of such a person is that the person is peaceful with himself. He is at peace with himself. He is at peace with the surroundings. And also he is at peace with all people around. These are natural attributes which come into the person. And this is, these are symptoms by which one could discover that such a spirit has dawned in this person. And for good many of them, automatically, they take to the way of life of a hermit. Of a hermit. So these are the little children. And they have these people have no political interest in the political arena. They have no social interest whatsoever. And at the same time too, they have no interest in religions too, or socio-religious belief systems and practices. They have no interest in that, in socio-religious practices too. So he's out of the mainstream of life, whether he is living as an ascetic outside, or he could live, he may be living as an ascetic, with an ascetical frame of mind in the residence where he is living. In the place or the residence where he is living, he may also live like an ascetic, with no outward interest in the mundane world. So therefore he says, for these people, these are the children of God. In fact, You can call them as the living represent, representative of God. And this fact is well understood and acknowledged in the hearts and minds of people in India, especially in North India. And therefore, they have facilitated a process and a way of life by which these hermits and hermit monks could live in their, in their society, in the midst of their society. They're entertained by the villagers, wherever they go, because they know that the presence of this individual sanctifies their village. His mere presence itself sanctifies their village. And at the same time, when these people enter a home too, they also sanctify a home or a house wherever they enter. So therefore, they are benign souls and another species apart from the rest of the rest of humanity. So therefore, Jesus is saying something about them. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me. Huh? So one should not or should never offend these people, cause them problems, cause them trouble cause them difficulties, because if one does, then Jesus says, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. It is better for such a person that if he were to harm or injure or be offensive to these holy ones who are moving about as hermits and living a spiritual life, then it is better for them to tie a stone and get drowned in the sea. It's far better. That's what he says. 
So therefore, now this is with respect to the hermits of the world. Then, now he is talking about another aspect of life. In line number 43, he says, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for, for them to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. And if thy hand offend thee, that is to say, if you do something wrong with your hands, which is incorrect, hmm? with your hands you may do very violent things, may use your hands to steal, to steal, you may use your hands. Theft will be coming, thefts are committed with your hands. Huh? And uh, with your hands, you may wrongly abuse people. You may, you may hit people. With your hands, you may slaughter people. You may kill people. So therefore, using your hand in a wrong manner, in a wrong manner, hmm? and especially people steal, with their hands. They steal with their hands. There are two forms of thefts. One is the monetary theft which people steal with their hands. The other is the legal theft wherein people with their pen, they begin stealing with, by using wrong documents, by signing and using wrong documents. That's called legal theft. So that too is a theft. So theft means Anything which belongs to another person and which is not morally and rightly yours. And if you take it, then it is said to be a theft. So therefore, he says, if thy hand offend thee by doing something wrong, or with your hand, if you were to hit anybody, hit somebody physically for no good reason, then it is better for that, for him to, uh, it is better for him to cut it off to cut off that particular hand, to cut it off. That's what he says, because you have used it wrongly. And it is better for them to enter into life maimed. It is better for this person to go about living life with only one hand rather than two hands, because, because this person for his offense, for his offense, he goes into hell. Now he's talking about hell. Now people very much wonder whether there is a hell. Huh? Then having two hands. So if you don't cut off your hand, which has been, which has been cut huh, for your theft, then you are, the person who is a thief will go to hell. Huh? With two hands, he will enter hell. With two hands, such a person would enter hell. So therefore, rather than going to hell itself, it is better for him to have his hand cut off, which did something wrong. And then having two hands to go into hell. And people wonder whether there is a hell. If there is a heaven, there is a counterpart hell too. In fact, there are even Paul refers to the third heavens. Paul, in one of his writings, Saint Paul in the Gospel, in the New Testament, he mentions the third heavens. Now, what is the third heavens? Third heavens is, of course, the first heavens is the heaven of returns, wherein you go for the good deeds and the good actions and the good things and the good way of life that you had lived, you have earned your holiday. You have obtained merit and you have earned your holiday. So therefore you are sent to heavens. You go to the heavens for a good time, for a short period. That is called the heavens of returns. Wherein you go for a short period and then come back once again to planet earth, having enjoyed your holiday there. That is holiday for the merits and the good deeds that you had done, the good things that you had done. Now, the second heaven is the heavens of no returns. 
And the heavens of no returns is what has been mentioned also by Jesus, wherein he will come down from the heavens with the angels and lead people up there to this. That's the second heavens of no returns, wherein you go to the heavens of no returns. That's the second heaven. But then Paul makes reference somewhere to the third heaven. And that is the state of enlightenment. The third heavens. So it is heavenly. The third heavens is a heavenly state of benign godly existence. Which transpires when a person gets enlightened. When a person gets enlightened. To the reality of his own existence. So these are the, these is heavens. Now juxtaposed to this, you have the hell. And hell is being mentioned. Hell has been mentioned in all the scriptures, in all the religious traditions. The concept of hell is there. It has been mentioned. And in hell, it's a remarkable thing in hell. He says, It is better for this, for this person to enter into life main than having two hands to go into hell, than to go to hell because for the crimes committed by a person, because generally crimes are committed by a, with your hands. With your hands, you commit crimes. Huh? And uh, into hell, in, into the fire that never shall be quenched. So you will enter the hell, one a person will enter the hell. Hell, there is a special region for that. Of course, if there is heaven, which is a pleasure resort, like going to Monte Carlo or the Riviera or to any other resort for a good time, for a short period, to enjoy your holidays. So, also, there is a hell to suffer the consequences of your cruel and misdeeds in while you were living as a human being, it's a natural, natural thing, natural corollary. So therefore, the fear of hell and what transpires in hell should be put across to the human race so that they shall be careful in not doing horrendous crimes. And crimes very often are done with your hands. With your hands, you use the knife, you use the sword, you use the guns to kill people and uh, use a staff. So therefore, the hand, you use the hand to burn people, burn people in their houses. People are burnt in their houses. So therefore, for correspondingly, this person will also have a corresponding experience there. As for instance, as an example, if you were to set light to, a, to the house or the whole house of a person with the people inside the house and the people there get burnt, they get burnt there. You've locked the doors and you've burnt them. This is something which happens quite often in many parts of the world. And then this person for his crime, for his crime, mobs do that all the time. <coughs> people don't realize that these mobs do that, even the mobs, they don't realize what the consequences of their acts. So these mobs, so therefore, when they go to hell, correspondingly, they will be set on fire. Huh? They'll be set on fire. And what happens there? The fire, where their warmth dieth not. Where the warmth, their warmth dieth not. So in hell, one has to consciously experience the horrors of whatever one has done. On planet Earth, with a human body, when people are set on fire, then the person, at a certain point, he becomes unconscious. At a certain point, he loses consciousness. And his body gets burnt, and he's burnt, and his body gets burnt after some time. But in hell, you don't become unconscious. That is why he says, where they are warm, diet not. 
the warmth in their body does not die. That is, they consciously experience. They consciously experience over and over again for a long period. And the fire is not quenched. And they'll be burning and burning and burning. So that is why when, you, when a person goes to hell, there too also he is received. He is well received there. And told these are his offenses or crimes. And told him now that you've got to go there to experience this. Now, it's a very interesting thing. In Singapore, there is, there is I don't know whether there is still, but the time when I went 40 years ago, I saw that there was a garden, there is a garden called the Tiger Balm Garden. In that Tiger Balm Garden, they were depicting in figurines exactly what happens or what transpires to people who go to hell. Very beautifully, graphically, huh? it was being uh, uh, shown there graphically in figurines so that uh, people who see it can understand what transpires in hell. Huh? So they are also, you're roasted in oil, you're roasted in oil, and you're set on, you're burnt on, in fire, but you will, the person will not become unconscious. Consciously, he has to experience it, scream in agony. So this is exactly what happens when people go to hell. So don't imagine that you can escape from your crimes. The reason is this. Somebody asked, is there justice in the world? There may, there may or may not be human justice in the world because of the fra fragile human beings. But there is definitely God's justice, God's justice, which relentlessly operates, relentlessly operates in the world. And quite often, the religious culture as such in the world, they glorify going to the heavens, but they don't want to tell you and describe to you what happens to you in hell. They want to cover it up. They want to cover it up. But Jesus is very careful here. He's telling you what will happen to you, what will happen to that person. So he says consciously, he'll be burnt there. He'll be roasted, like being roasted in a fire, on a hot, in a hot plate. Huh? So these are the things which happen to the per which happens to a person. And the fire is not quenched. Then in the line, num line number 45, he says, and if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt, in, in, uh, to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. So now, having said about a hand which committeth crimes, now he says, if thy foot offend thee, of course your foot also offend when you misuse your feet and go to wrong places and do wrong things with your feet. With your feet, when there is a mob which is going, you join the mob. Hmm? And uh, go about rioting and looting. Uh, you're using your feet to go there and to burn and destroy. So you're using your wrong, your feet, your foot for a wrong purpose. So if thy foot offend thee, and if you were to kick people and misuse your foot, then cut it off. It is better for you to cut it off. It is better for you to enter, to enter halt into life. Because if your leg, foot is cut off, then your life's activities are halted now. Your mobility is halted. Because that is a, that's a punishment, you know. So that uh, you will always constantly remember for the, the offense that you had done. And therefore your lifestyle gets halted, halt in life. Then having two feet to be cast into hell. Then to have your two feet and then go to hell. Into the fire that shall never be quenched. So it's a fire indeed. You are you're, you're in the fire. You're in the fire of life there. And 
the fire is in the in hell. There is screaming and torments and horrors. All this will transpire. And the fire that never shall be quenched until you are there. If you had, uh, if you had murdered or killed a hundred people, so a hundred times over you have to be there. Not, not once, but hundred times over, over and over again for each crime that you had committed. So, and where the warmth, warmth, warm diet not, the heat in your body does not die means you don't become unconscious. You consciously experience it. And the fire is not quenched. So until, until your punishment is, has been received by an experience by you, you will, one has to remain there. And if thine eye, if thine third one, line number 47, and if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. And if thy eye offend thee, that is to say, with your eyes, you are only supposed to see benign things. You are not supposed to see certain, certain, un, certain unbenign things. Certain, certain things you are not supposed to see. And if you were to use your eyes to see all those things which you are not supposed to see with your eyes, then if the eye offend thee, so that by thereby you have misused your eyes. Your eyes were meant for a good purpose, to see things in a good way. If you take a perverse pleasure in viewing and seeing sadis and enjoying sadistic happenings, sadistic pleasures, offensive pleasures, if you enjoy with your eyes others being beaten up, if you enjoy that, instead of putting a stop to it, if you enjoy others being killed and, mur and murdered, because people do that all the time, especially when there is a religious hatred, racial hatred, during these periods, people enjoy killing another person of another tribe, of another religion, of another race, of another community. They take a pleasure in that, in seeing that person being killed and destroyed with their eyes. They're happy about it. So then he says, and if thy eye offend thee, and if you see something offensive, and one of the things which is offensive is, that is why worldwide pornography is banned. That's offensive. That's offensive. So therefore, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. Take for your eye out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye huh? than having two eyes and to be cast into hell. So that is what he says. Therefore, whenever something wrong is being Wrong is happening. Walk away from the place. Disappear from the place. You're not supposed to see that. Hmm? Bear their, and so bear their warm diet not and the fire is not quenched. Then having said this much about hell, because uh, this is one instance wherein Jesus is very clearly outlining what will happen to a person who will be who will be thrown into hell or who, will have, who has to go to hell. They have booked their ticket, shall we put it that way. So whenever a person commits uh, an unpardonable crime, he has booked his ticket to go to hell. And the fear of it should be put into the minds of people because once you put it, the fear of God is one thing and the fear of what will happen to you in heaven or in hell 
also should be put into the minds of people so that people can go about in right ways and not re and refrain from doing wrong things from doing murderous things out of fear they would refrain from it that is why jesus is outlining this then having said this much in line number 49 he says it's a different section now a different topic a wonderful section is open he is opening out now for everyone shall be salted with fire and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt that is to say for everyone shall be salted with fire salted with the fire of life everyone the fire of life when you want to purify something you put it into the fire to purify it the gold is purified when you put it into fire and smelt it in fire it gets purified so also the fire of life in which a person undergoes and goes through hardships and difficulties it purifies this person that's the fire of life which purifies a person and makes him a better individual a pure individual because he is melted in the fire of life but here there is a, another meaning to this there is another meaning and sense to this for everyone shall be salted with fire everyone in the world in due course will be and has will be and shall be salted with fire fire here means wisdom knowledge be salted with wisdom knowledge or be salted with god awareness in due course in due course when as one when one has gone through the fire of life and purged and thus having been purged of one's errors and omissions and one has become a better and a more purified individual a better being then god sees to it that this person gets salted with with gets salted with fire with a fire of knowledge which is god awareness with which is god awareness so it will happen to every person in due course so everyone shall be salted with fire salted with fire the wisdom with god awareness in due course and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt and every sacrifice here the word sacrifice has been used the word sacrifice here means every action that you do in the world every karma which you go through in life and the performance of all your actions in the world has to be done as a ritual so you are the ritualistic you are the priest you are the priest and you are performing every action huh? every action of yours as a sacrifice as a sacrifice you're performing all each and every one of your actions in uh, so with the spirit of sacrifice with the spirit of sacrifice you are going through the operations of your life huh? and there that, that's what he says and every act sacrifice every action which is so done as a sacrifice because there are many actions that you go through in life wherein you may not like it but you may have to do it so therefore you willingly accept those actions and consciously and lovingly execute those actions 
to its to its best then that is a sacrifice done by you you're sacrificing your energy your resources your time in executing a particular action and when that happens it's a sacrifice so every field of operation is a sacrifice should be done with the attitude of a sacrifice it's a ritual a ritual is a sacrifice when it is done with what every sacrifice shall be salted with salt so every action that you do shall be salted with salt with god awareness so when you perform your actions with god awareness you're salting those actions which have now become a sacrifice and thereby you get sanctified by this process you get sanctified sanctification transpires in due course as you keep on performing your actions as a sacrifice a mother takes care of a newborn baby as a sacrifice the father takes care of his family as a sacrifice as a matter of duty so they all go through their duty and perform those actions lovingly and and very well and they are going through a sacrifice in fact to bring forth a little child and bringing up to the age of 21 you the parents go through a great deal of sacrifice in bringing up that boy or the girl so that's a sacrifice that's a sacrifice so thus every sacrifice every action that is done should be shall be salted with salt with god awareness so when you do it with god awareness then it becomes a, a sanctifying ritual the technical word for this is this process is then you are going through karma yoga or the yoga of action simple in simple terms this is called karma yoga in short that's all but jesus has used another phraseology to explain the science of karma yoga in simple terms by saying that every action every sacrifice shall be salted with salt shall be salted with salt so in this manner every action is now being dedicated is is performed with god awareness and at the same time it is being dedicated unto the lord and thereby it becomes a sacrifice indeed then he says in line number 50 salt is good salt is good but if the salt have lost its saltiness salt is good all of you know very well no huh? and uh, salt is what makes life it makes your food also tasty and delicious and good and good but if the salt has lost its saltiness of what use is it or what use is it so here also where will you, where with will you season it if it has lost its saltiness where how will you season your food your how will you season your food so here also when you live your life with god awareness you are seasoning your food your life ha huh? you're seasoning your life with this awareness with god awareness so therefore this is that salt indeed and if you don't have this god awareness of what use is it of your life you are living like an animal the difference between an animal and a human animal is that animal has four legs the human animal has two legs but they have got one thing in common they have got a worldly perspective worldly joys worldly pleasures but on the other hand if you are salted with his god awareness then you are a different person you don't live like an animal anymore huh? and therefore if you don't live like that what use is this is your life you are just living you are just eating and drinking and uh, sleeping and dying that's about it or what use is your life thereafter 
So therefore he says, have salt in yourselves. Have salt in yourself. Have this God awareness constantly with yourself. Have salt in yourselves. And at the same time, have peace one with the other. Also have peace one with the other. Live in peace. So naturally, when you have this God awareness, automatically you will have peace and be at peace with one another. One another. You will be at peace with yourself and you will be at peace with one another. With those around you, you will be at peace with your neighbors, with your countrymen. You will be at peace with your neighboring countries, neighboring country people. You will be at peace with others, provided you have this God awareness. But since people don't have this God awareness, they have got a religious awareness. That's a different issue altogether. That's not God awareness at all. Huh? In the name of religion, they begin to fight with each other. So that's, there is no God involved there. There's only religion which is involved. So by this itself, it, was, it should be very clear to you, there's a grand, great difference between what is understood as religion and what is understood as God. So therefore he says, have salt in yourself, have this God awareness. And when you have this God awareness, you will automatically be at peace with one another, with everyone around you in the world, in the, in, with all humanity, you'll be at peace. Then, having said this much, now we, we get to chapter 10. In chapter 10, and he arose from thence and cometh into the coast of Judea by the further side of Jordan. And from that place where he had been, and it was indicated that he had been in the home of Peter, from the home of Peter where he had stayed for some time, and he arose from there, then in Capernaum, where in home of Peter was in Capernaum. And then he came into the coast of Judea by the further side of Jordan, by the other side of the Jordan River. The Jordan River goes through and the people resort unto him again. And the people on the other side, the moment they heard him, they resorted unto him. They went to him as he want. He taught them again and again as, as he was wont, as was his custom. He taught them again. He taught those people who had come to receive and meet him and see him on the other side of Jordan River. So he taught them. So wherever Jesus went, he was teaching people. So it was a glorious ministry for three years. And the remarkable thing is, to whichever, in whichever town or a village or the countryside that he stayed, and he gave the teachings, those teachings could be considered to be sermons. They are said to be the gospels. Those sermons, the collection of those sermons is the gospel. Although we have only four gospels today currently available in the world, but at that time, <clears throat> in the, at the dawn and the beginning of the Christian world of Christianity, it is said that there were over 100 gospels of different nature being taught at different places in the Middle East, in and around Jerusalem and in the, and Israel and surrounding areas. Over 100 Gospels. So what amount of wealth of knowledge would have been there? But, but nevertheless, we have only four, which is good enough for our present purpose. And there, once again, and the forest line number two, Chapter 10, and the Pharisees came to him and asked him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? And of course the Pharisees, these I said, these are the lay priests, the Pharisees. And they didn't like Jesus. They want to trap him and trip him somewhere. They want to trap him and trip him somewhere. So now the, once again, they are trying to trip him. <clears throat> and the Pharisees came to him and asked him, 
Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? You know, tempt him to say something. Is it lawful? Is it okay for a man to put away his wife, to divorce his wife? <clears throat> and Jesus answered in line number three, and he answered and said unto them, what did Moses command you? What did Moses tell you? Because Moses was the one who has given, who as a prophet, he had opened out and the commandments were given via Moses to the Israelites at that time. So what did Moses command you? <clears throat> and they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. Uh, they said Moses, of course, told us to write a note or a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered to that. And Jesus answered and said unto them, for the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. Because your heart is hard, for the hard, hardness of your heart, he wrote this precept. Because you are hard-hearted. You don't want to entertain, take care, protect, and look after your wife. And therefore, because of your hardness in nature, so as a concession, Moses may have, may have said, did say that. But, but, there's a but being used here. But, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. So Jesus is saying something very profound. From the beginning of creation, but God made them male and female. They made them male and female. They are said to be two halves. Male is one half, female is the other half. So the two halves have to be joined together. They have to come together. Because they are two halves. That's what he's implying here. God made them male and female. So as, separate, as a separate entity, they are incomplete. As a male, the man is incomplete. As a female, the woman is incomplete. But when they are brought together and become one, they become complete. That's the implication here. And from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. But, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his cleave to his wife. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female, and they, they would automatically come together. This is not very natural. This is something which is found in all species, in all animals, in all birds, and in the human race too. This is a very natural thing. It's a very natural thing. By, by the time the person reaches the age of about 20, they want each other. It's a very natural impulse, a human, human nature, human impulse. So therefore, God made them male and female so that they can come together, so that they can come together now. And therefore, for this cause, shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. So for this purpose, what happens for them to come together? The poor chap who was brought up by his parents, uh, the poor man who was brought up, when he reaches the ages by 21 or so, this he shall, a man will leave his father and mother, even though lovingly they had brought him up. A girl appears from nowhere and this solo runs away. Poor chap. Huh? And, and then he cleaves to his wife and he makes the girl his wife he, and cleave to his wife, leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. So this is a very natural thing indeed. It's very natural to the human race. And their twain shall be one, one flesh, and their twain shall be one flesh. They shall come together and be one, one flesh. So that they are no more twain but one flesh. But they are no more two. So a marriage is a successful or a good marriage when the couple feel that they are one and not two. When they deal in their 
when they function as a as a unified entity in unity with oneness as and the concept is we not i we we is the word so the man and woman should feel that they are together as one unit as one unit and when they feel that they are one unit then that marriage is a successful marriage they shall be one flesh so that they are no more twain but they are not two they are not separate their interest their wants they have way of life has merged together and they become one operative principle a huh? operative unit having the family as a center of operations having their children as a center of operations so that they are no more twain but one flesh and then the next line is very intriguing what therefore god had joined together let not man put asunder what god has joined together god has brought them together and let not man put this put asunder so therefore the couple which who have been brought together the man and the woman who have been brought together by god let no man for any reason disturb that marriage or try to put them asunder it's a great error it's a great sin if they try to separate the man and the woman they should try to see to it that they are constantly made to be made to be together and brought to and be together so that is why he says let not let not man put asunder whom god had joined together whom god had joined together you know there is a popular expression which says marriages are made in heaven that is very true that is very correct for each couple the partner the corresponding partner has been selected by god so that is why the expression marriages are made in heaven has been selected by god and at at a, a due time at the correct time on planet earth they are brought together and it is solemnized by the fellow humans so it is not the other the family people who select the bride and the bridegroom for their respective children but it is god who has already selected them god has selected them so there is a a woman meant for every man and a man meant for a woman and this god knows god knows who is to be brought and who and in what manner they are to be brought together and he also and don't imagine that when the when a man and a woman come together as a couple in this life do not imagine that this is a a new contact no they had already had an interaction in their previous lives in some other form in some other form they did have an interaction in whatever form it be and those people at that time and with that interaction they were there was it was incomplete that interaction was incomplete in many sense and now in this life they are brought together they are brought together by god to complete something to fulfill something an incomplete interaction which was which they had acquired which they had gone through earlier is now made to be complete either in this life or in future lives too it may take more than one lifetime so therefore if you don't want to have your current wife or your current husband for the next lifetime see to it that you do take do them have the best care and take care of them very well and take care of them so lovingly otherwise it is unfinished business and you will be burdened with them 
once again in another lifetime to complete the process, to complete the business. So therefore, so it is not a new relationship that you're having. You had this interaction before in some other form. In some other form. You could have been brothers and sisters. You could have been uh, relatives. You could have been cousins. You could have been good friends. Huh? Or you could have been even husband and wife in another lifetime too. But you are brought together in this lifetime. Huh? So it is God who has selected you. God who has selected you, so selected the bride and the bridegroom for each other. So that is why he says, but therefore God had joined together. So God has joined together. He knows to whom to join and whom to not to join. In fact, the wise Socrates was once asked by a young man, the wisdom of getting married. And Socrates apparently had a very difficult wife, almost an impossible wife. So Socrates replied, well, if you have a good wife, you will be happy in the, you will be happy. But if you had a wife like mine, you will end up as a philosopher. So that is why Socrates, the wife Socrates. So that was a classic reply. So it's not a bad deal at all. It's either way, you don't lose. Either way. So therefore, so what God had joined together, let no man come in between. It's an error. Then, let no man put asunder whom God has brought together, whom God has brought together. That is why the Christian marriage vow, which is... Uh, mentioned in the Christian marriage ceremony is an excellent one. And the priest will, in getting the couple married, he makes a statement. He says, you are, to, you are a husband and wife to mutually take care of each other in prosperity and adversity, in sorrow and happiness, in good fortune and misfortune, in sickness and good health, they shall care for each other. They shall care for each other. So all this will be happen. In a married life, you will have prosperity and you may have also ad adversity. And you're going to navigate your prosperity and adversity. You're going to navigate together. Sorrows and happiness, both will come to you at times There'll be sorrow and at times there'll be happiness. So with sorrow and happiness, you've got to navigate your life. Good fortune and misfortune will also come to you in a married life. Sickness and good health. So there would be sickness too and good health. And then you've got to mutually take care of each other huh? and care for each other. So the foundation of, of a marriage is love love. You lovingly take care of each other. Lovingly take care of each other's needs. Lovingly look after each other. Because you have been brought together by divine providence. And it has now become your duty to go through this operation. And that is why he says, What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Hmm? Then, having said this much, another interesting aspect. I shall complete that too. Because that goes along with this. In line number 10, and in the house of his disciples, in the house of his disciples, asked him again of the same matter. And after he had said this, then uh, when Jesus returned back to the house in which he was staying, his disciples asked him again about this matter. 
and he said unto them, and he told them, now he's not saying, telling them once again, whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committed adultery against her. That is to say, <coughs> if a man were to put away his wife because he wants to marry, marry another woman, then he committed adultery. That man is committing adultery against this woman, which he should not do. Because adultery is prohibited. It is not acceptable. It is a great error. So therefore, whoever shall put away his wife and marry another person, huh? marry another, committed adultery against her. So the man commits adultery if he does that. Therefore, he should never put away his wife in order to marry another woman. And then the reverse is also there. And in line number 12, he says, and if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committed adultery. And then the reverse is also true, wherein if a man shall put away her husband and uh, try to get married to another, she committed, then she too commits also adultery. So that means on no account should a woman leave her husband and on no account should a husband leave his wife for another person. So marriage is an inviolable act and they separate at the time of death. Unto death they are together. That's the only time they can separate. At no other time should they, should they separate. So that is what Jesus, that Jesus says here. So therefore, because marriage is a sacred institution, it's a sacred institution, and uh, it sanctifies the persons, the persons who are involved in it, it does good to them. It does good to them. It makes them wiser, makes them better, makes them happier, makes them well. Therefore, it's, after all, it's not a bad institution. For those who want it, for those who don't want it, well, it's well and good. It's fine. They don't need it. But for those who need it, it's well and good. So therefore, this has to be, you've got to understand this. There are certain others, freaks, you may call them freaks or unusual characters who wish to become hermits, either as a hermit monk or a hermit nun. For them, this is irrelevant. That is not, that's a design. That's basically beside the point. But for all the others, it's a good institution. So therefore, that's what Jesus says here. And Om Tatsat.